Okay, uh, Christian Koller is the department head for building technologies at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, working on all aspects of building energy efficiency. Uh, it's uh, my 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 bios gets shorter and shorter during as the evening goes on. Uh, but as I said before, if you go to lasertalks.com, you find extended bios and links uh, to their web pages. So, Christian, all yours. Thanks, Piero. Let me uh, get my screen going here. Okay. See, are you seeing the slides? Yeah, you're not seeing the preview, right? You're seeing the, the proper sl full slide. Piero? Uh, I was muted, yes. Okay. Great. So um, it's an interesting place. I was just reflecting, I guess, there was the past in our first talk about history, then there was the future in Anastasia's talk. And I'm going to be kind of more in the middle where, where we are today and a little bit more down to um, where what we're doing today with, with buildings. And Kiero asked me to kind of talk about how are we improving buildings. And so um, the first Thing I have to talk about is why do we um, why do we want to talk about buildings? And so buildings are a large energy sector. These are numbers for the U.S., but it's similar in other parts of the world. Um, that about forty percent of the energy used in the country is used in in buildings. But if you look at the electricity use, so that is um, gas and 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 electricity. If you just purely look at electricity, it's more than three quarters of the electricity is used in buildings. And so you see the, the distribution here. And um, what we also have to deal with, of course, is that we have residential and commercial buildings. We have new construction retrofits. So there's a lot of variation here. But um, the key point here is that buildings are a large fraction of the US energy consumption. Um, I wanted to start with a few. I'm, I'm just picking out a few things of research that, that we worked on on buildings. And I wanted to start with a few things that actually affect um, humans and human comfort in buildings. And so the first one that I want to talk about a little bit is this, uh, this chair. And this is in the, in the area of how do we make buildings more comfortable. Um, the number one complaint in buildings are some people are hot and some people are cold. And sometimes that happens at the same time. Um, it also happens throughout the day at different times. People come in in the morning. Maybe they've been walking from the bus or up the stairs. They might be a little, a little warm. They want to cool down. But then as they're getting closer towards lunch and they're getting a little hungry, they might get a little colder and they want it warmer. So this myth of setting one temperature, you know, 21 degrees Celsius or 73 Fahrenheit, and that's it for everyone in the building the whole day is, is, is a myth. So uh, one thing here that this, this research team was doing is, is taking a chair and adding some cooling to it by having fans in the seat and in the back of the, the chair, and also having some heating in there. And so now I, as a person, can control how warm I want to be or how cool I want to be. Um, there's, there's a little slider on the chair here. There's also uh, a, an app here. And so now, instead of conditioning, you know, making the whole building comfortable, all this big space around you, you just make sure that you as a person are comfortable. And so if you have a, a big office building and there's less people in there, for example, now with COVID, some buildings are operating at 10 or 20% capacity. It's much more efficient to just warm or cool those people and have the general space be comfortable. It's not like you don't wanna do any conditioning of the space, but you wanna do it, uh, you, you need to do it much less energy intense. Um, Another area of, of kind of personal comfort in buildings is, uh, is about lighting. So in the upper right, you see what, a, uh, what an office currently might look like in um, a cubicle with, with this kind of lighting. And what that, what that misses is that that lighting is at the same level the whole day, morning, middle of the day, afternoon, just like what I was talking about, temperature always being the same in buildings. Um, what to humans, what, when, we, when we're outside, we experience sunrise in the morning where there's warm light. Then in the middle of the day when, it's, when the sun is overhead, it's cooler light in the afternoon, it gets a little warmer again. 
So what people have found out is that um, something called circadian lighting, um, supporting the circadian rhythm of, of a person. And so that affects your sleep, your alertness. And here's an example of a children's hospital in Philadelphia, where you see what a room might look like at 6.30 in the morning. This is kind of sunrise, you know, middle of the day and afternoon. And in this case, they also can vary if they let the outside light in the daylight out in or not. And the curve on the, on the right here is, is uh, uh, a graph that shows the, the wavelengths of light. And we probably all remember this from physics classes, you know, where the, the green is kind of in the middle here, and this is the, uh, towards the ultraviolet. And then on the y-axis is the sensitivity of our eye to it. And so the normal eye sensitivity peaks at 555 nanometers green light. That, that's where we're most sensitive, where it gives us the most um, brightness sensation. But this dashed line is actually this response to our circadian lighting. So that thing that affects how alert we are or how awake we are. And that is triggered by a light that's a little bit bluer. And so you might have heard where people say, like, don't have um, blue light or very white cold light at night before going to bed. You know, don't have your, um, your TV or your phone on just before bed, because what that does is it stimulates this circadian response and you're about to go to bed, but that would be waking you up. And so, um, in this, this space, also in this hospital, for example, you can then regulate um, people's uh, day-night sleep cycle. Um, another way to get, of course, this lighting um, impact is to look at um, daylight. Because um, daylight is free, right? There's no energy intensity with, with generating daylight. You just have a window and the light comes in. Um, one issue you can have is, is glare. So in this picture, you see a, a pretty horrible work set up where um, there's a lot of direct light coming in and this person will probably get a headache or not be able to, to read much as they're see seated here. Um, but we can control that. This is uh, an experiment we did at our uh, Flex Lab facility at Berkeley Lab. Um, actually, that's my virtual background. So what you're seeing is, uh, is one of these rooms here. And here there's some shades. And if you look carefully, you see that the ceiling is very light here. What this shade does is it redirects light to the ceiling. And that light that is redirected to the ceiling then comes kind of down here. So what you also notice is these lights are on, but the lights closer to the window are off. So that's a good energy efficient design where you have not all the lights on or all the lights off, but you turn the ones near the window off and the ones further away from the window you turn them on. Um, one way that this was done, uh, we did a, a project. Uh, this is at a Goldman Sachs building in, in New York City. That was a fairly new building. And we wanted to see what we could do, what, how we could improve it. And so um, they retrofitted the lights. And now the lights are daylight controlled. So that means if there's a lot of daylight, the lights will dim. Um, they added these automated roller shades that can go up and down depending on the sun and how bright it is outside. Um, they already had this uh, what's called underfloor air where they're bringing in a little bit air from under the floor as opposed to having this air conditioning dumping lots of cold air on you. And so with, with this case, uh, with this uh, design, they're able to save energy on the order of 70% or more. Uh, part of that was replacing uh, fluorescent lights with LEDs, but also a lot of work in controls. I just added a slide um, when I saw the uh, the wonderful graphics that uh, Anastasia and her team had. I was reminded of this uh, um, animation of a nature responsive building design. And let me just play the video. Let me first make sure that it's. Uh, give me one sec here. Optimize for video clip. Here we go. So this shows how a building might respond throughout the day. So you see that um, the sun comes up, it might open up in a certain pattern to provide view. Um, it might then close at certain times. It might open this facade in the afternoon, just a little bit here. Then in the, later in the afternoon, it might open up again. So this is just one concept where you could actually have a building like a flower or like a plant that changes 
um, in response to the available light. So um, this is a concept. There's been some buildings with simpler versions of this, but one can imagine a more uh, um, dynamic building. So that was a little bit about the human in the building. Now I want to talk a little bit about some technologies and what we're, what we're looking at. One of the things, uh, a trend that we're uh, very interested in, very working hard on, especially in California also, is uh, what we call decarbonization. And that means changing our en energy sources um, from gas to um, all electricity. So here's a house, for example, where you have solar panels generating electricity. And then you have a heat pump water heater here that can generate hot water. You have an inductive stove here that can cook with electricity. You have, for example, an instant pot, like a pressure cooker that's all electric, and you can have an electric car. So instead of having a car that uses gasoline, a, a water heater that's based on gas, and a stove that's based on gas, you, you go, um, you change everything to be based uh, from electricity. Now, there's a scale issue there, because if you, um, start generating a lot of solar power, you're not always using that power at, at the time when it's being produced. For example, you get the most solar production in the middle of the day, but we're usually cooking dinner at, at night. And so um, this is something that's called the duck curve. And if you kind of squint, you can see the shape of a, of a duck in here. Um, and this, it, this is about um, a few years ago, but this trend is, is holding true. And what, the, what this shows is this is a full day. So here we're in the middle of the day um, and this is night and here this is 6, 7 p.m. when people are coming home and cooking. And this is the total electricity consumed in California in the electricity grid. And what you see is as the years progress from, from their kind of baseline from 2012, um, we get more and more solar panels, we get more and more electricity produced in the middle of the day, which means we use less electricity in the middle of the day. Um, we still use about as much at night and we use as much uh, in the early part of the day. The issue here is that you have this very steep ramp where suddenly between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. you have to add a lot of electricity um, production to the grid and that's that's quite intensive. So during the day you say, oh, we have all the solar power. We don't need any power plants. We're, we're all good, you know, like let's shut them all down. Then the sun goes down, or of course you have a, a winter storm um, and you lose electricity product or you need, you need a, uh, additional um, production. So one way to address this is with, um, with batteries. So here's, for example, what's called a Tesla power wall, which is the same kind of batteries that you might find in a Tesla car installed in a house with a solar system next to it. So now you can store the electricity that's generated, let's say at noon and use it at other times. Or if the grid goes down, like the, the big storms in, in Texas, that the uh, cold snap a couple of weeks ago, you have local power. A cheaper way, and this is quite expensive because there's a lot of batteries in here to power your house, a cheaper way is this solar inverter um, made by Sunny Boy, which actually gives you a little uh, um, outlet down here. This gray box is a, is a separate outlet. And when the utility grid goes down, so when the power company um, shuts off the power, you can still plug devices in here into these two outlets and power things. So you could run an extension cord to your fridge, for example, and keep your fridge going and run an extension cord and plug in your charger electronics or, or so. So we think a lot about resilience because as we make homes more electric, we also need to make sure that things keep working when the, when the power goes out. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about how we are doing this research. And um, this is, as you see my virtual background as well, this is a facility called Flex Lab um, at uh, Berkeley Lab where, where I work. And here we have a number of these side-by-side -side test situations. So here you see, two side-by-side -side rooms. So we put in this room, uh, this is a facade that was a mock-up for a building by Genentech in South San Francisco. And next to it, we just kept the standard windows, uh, normal glass, no shading. And then we can compare side-by-side -side 
how um, the impacts are from, from certain things like different lighting systems, different glass, different shading systems. Uh, one uh, recent research we've done in that facility <clears throat> is actually looking at COVID aerosols. So we, we set up this, this table, uh, kind of a, a conference setup, conference room setup, and each of the mannequins here has like a little uh, valve coming out here where, they, where they're spraying out aerosols and they have little uh, detectors. And these, each of these mannequins, these reflective stripes are actually heated tape. So they, are, they have a warm skin. So if, if hot air rises up, like the aerosol plume might rise up, we can, uh, we can um, model and measure that. Here's an example of uh, what an interior uh, test might look like. So this is the, the test for, uh, for the Genentech building where we have the desk here. We got all the furniture and all the um, shading devices as they want to put it, wanted to put it into their building. And then we add a lot of sensors. So we add sensors that measure comfort. We have sensors that look at the light. And so we can see, for example, that this might not be so great when you're looking at your laptop screen and you have this big bright band of, of sunlight coming across your desk. Um, we can look at that and we can say, well, maybe we need to change the design of these shades a little bit. Um, we also have a, a part of Flex Lab, what we call Flex Grid, which is a, um, where we're looking at grid connection between buildings. So we have, we have these Flex Lab buildings, we have solar panels on them, we have uh, Tesla batteries, we, we have what's called a grid simulator, so we can make our own um, electricity grid. And then we have an electric car that is with a bi-directional charger. So we can either charge the car or the car can power the building. Um, and so it's what's called a bi-directional vehicle to building or vehicle to grid um, setup. I wanna show you a quick um, movie of something. This was just installed about last week. This is a um, prefab panel. So, Building construction is very slow. You've probably all seen construction sites and it seems like nothing is ever getting finished. It takes forever. This is an idea we're looking at prefab panels. And so here comes a half of this facade panel comes in and is just lifted into place um, as one whole unit. Uh, so it's not, it's built in a factory, it's put on a truck and then this forklift puts it in. And that's one half of it. And then the second panel is, comes here. You see, it, you see it driving down the road here. It comes in, takes a few seconds to get, to get set up here. And then they, uh, here they, they lift it in. There we go. So then they um, place that in, into place. So now you have just closed up a facade in, uh, very little time and then the windows just snap into that rather than building it all on site and if it's a rainy day you can't work so that's something that uh, we're looking at more now which which we're calling uh, prefab prefabricated construction prefab panels so in summary um, some of the things i talked about were the human aspects of our research so personal comfort lighting glare the electricity grid and, and carbon emissions. So this um, shift to electric devices, duck curve, resilience and batteries, and then how we do research. And then I wanted to mention in closing where we're going also is looking at something called energy justice. Some of you might've heard about environmental justice. So with energy justice, we're looking at how do we make sure that the benefits of the climate investments, the research, the new technologies benefits everyone. And in this case, 40% of the benefits should go to what's called disadvantaged communities. So communities that are a struggle with um, employment, with health issues, you know, that some of them are in areas where with a very unhealthy air or, or uh, bad soil quality. And so we're looking at how can this research that we're doing in Berkeley affect, positively affect uh, people in other communities. So with that, Piero, that's the end of my slides. I'll stop sharing. I, I, I love the concept of uh, <clears throat> circadian lighting. Uh, 
I'm somebody who opens the window when it's cold because if it's cold outside, I want to be cold inside. And as you know, I don't use air conditioning in, even in the car. And I never thought of the lighting. Uh, that's uh, you started something. Now, now I will pay more attention to this. Um, um, so we have a, you have a question, a, probably a natural question that a uh, few people have is the cost. Uh, you can read the question, the last Q, the last in the QA. Uh, so the last one at home setting reasonable cost. Um, so uh, so the, uh, let's, uh, let's read the question. So how, how many, many of your many... building efficient, uh, efficiency and lighting designs can be translated to a work at home setting for a reasonable cost? Um, Actually, you know, for the lighting design, working from home is, is great because you might have been at work in a dark cubicle in the center of a building, but at home, you get to pick where you sit. Some people sit in the kitchen because they have amazing light in the kitchen and they're like, I'm taking my conference calls from the kitchen and I have great lighting. We also talk about something called a, a circadian snack that, um, you know, sometimes when you work in an office building, you might at noon or lunchtime want to go outside and just be out in a bright sun for 20 minutes and get kind of a, a bunch of that stimulation of your system. Well, if you're at home, you probably have a lot more flexibility of um, walking over to the window while you're on a conference call or going sitting in the, in the yard, in the garden outside. Um, so from an electric lighting point of view, um, there's more and more light bulbs that can change color. So if you have LED bulbs and change color, you can set them to a, a warmer color in the morning and the evening and a cooler kind of bluish color in the middle of the day. And the, the thing about the personal comfort systems is um, those are actually also easier at home because you can, have, you can have a fan, like Piero said, you can open the window. You, have, you tend to have a lot more control on your environment at home or for example, when you're in your car, you can, you can set the temperature, you can set how much air you wanna have blowing or if you wanna roll down the window. And unfortunately in offices, sometimes people don't have that flexibility because they're just stuck at a desk and they can't open a window. So I think it's actually much easier working from home. Uh, but, but the question in general is about cost. Uh, when you design these things, of course they look great. Uh, I mean, everybody wants them. Uh, but is uh, do you keep uh, your uh, your focus also on the cost? I mean, you have uh, uh, is is cost one of the factors in designing these things, uh, especially not just the cost for the individual, but cost if you wanted to uh, go on a on a large scale. Uh, it's, that's I mean, eventually it's money, right? Yeah. So. Cost is super important with what I was talking about, like disadvantaged communities work, right? Like if we, if we want to, you know, get a house in San Francisco and put, you know, $30,000 in fancy batteries in it, you know, someone's saying, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. But we want to make sure that it works everywhere. And so we have to look at, at, at cost. Um, there's always the first research is make it, make it work, you know, like make it, make a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter little special window and say, look, this, this works. Um, then you say, so there's this concept called technology readiness levels. And if you make something like bench top size, that's like technology ready level three, then you get to like, okay, I've made one that is, that can be put in one office building, you know, so like the, the, the 10 windows behind me here, and it's still expensive. And then you start, um, at some point, you also have to start thinking about cost, but you cannot, it's hard to start about cost when you do kind of fundamental research, because right. then you would say every, oh, can't do it, can't do it, right? And you have to stay broad. But um, it's the usual thing, economies of scale, you know, you want to get something in a lot of homes or buildings. And one thing that can help with that is um, building energy codes, right? A building energy code is the law. So if the law says that you have to put triple glazings into your building in Minnesota, there is no like, well, this is too expensive. It's the law, everyone has to do it. The manufacturers know like everyone has to buy these windows. So they will ramp up manufacturing and make, make lots of them. So we as researchers are always dependent on other programs that help 
scale it up. And, and energy codes are, are a great one because when it becomes law, scale goes up, cost goes down. And so this was just a 20 minute teaser. I'm sure you could talk for hours. Uh, what kind of outreach do you do? How do you spread the word? How do you publicize all the ideas that you guys have? Yeah, so um, there's many different forms. One form pre-COVID is that we, we did tours. You know, we would get, um, you know, a group from a, uh, like an asso association of mayors, you know, like mayors from a number of cities come or a, a, school, a school group. Um, and we showed them the technology. Uh, we also are working more at having videos that are the different audience. So there's videos that are for other scientists because we want to share, just like we do journal publications. But we're also working on having videos that are fairly basic that people can see and watch. And, and it is great because with videos, you just put them on your website once you've made them. And whether 10 people look at them or 10,000 people, it doesn't cost you anything more. I mean, there's not really a bandwidth cost. So um, for outreach for the um, underserved communities, we are, we are going into the communities and we're, doing, we're working with partner organizations. So there's these community-based organizations that work in a group. So we're working in Fresno, for example, and there's, there's groups there that have been working with um, local residents and we connect with them and we say how do we prepare our material so it's understandable and of course it is multi-language is one of the issues it's not just all english language but it's also someone was telling us recently is like you know infographics are really useful because you can still have some words in there but it's it's much less cognitive load if you have pictures and a few words that you have to kind of understand and so we're looking at that but it's it's a shift because traditional as you know the science approach is journal articles you know you publish a dense article and you you know get a feather in your cap like you're publishing yeah and it's uh, it's not obvious i, I mean uh, an artist has an obvious uh, audience people love art uh, in your case the ideal audience is everybody literally everybody but not everybody reads those magazines not everybody knows that you exist so so it's kind of tricky. Uh, you, have well, one, one, you have one more question in the QA. Speaking of environmental justice, how do you ensure that the system is made accessible for underserved communities? So the, um, some of our research is funded by the California Energy Commission. And they have now programs where a, a research project has to be done in a disadvantaged community. So it's not like it also has to work there. You have to only do it. So we're working on some triple glazed windows that we are going to install in some multifamily buildings in Fresno and in a farming community called Santa Maria on the central coast. And all the projects are going to be in underserved communities. And so California has a map where you can see, and it depends, it's low income, but it's also environmental um, impacts. So for example, along um, I-5 and Route 99, which I know Piero has driven many times down to LA, uh, it's a very bad air pollution there. You know, it's dusty, it's uh, agriculture, you know, it's, it, there's really, really, um, you know, intense factory farming there. It's really bad air quality and water quality. And so along that corridor, you get a lot of disadvantaged communities. And income is also very strongly correlated with a life expectancy. So there's something called the Healthy Places Index in California that you can just Google Healthy Places Index and you see a map. And for each zip code, they show you how healthy is your place. And they basically, if it's an unhealthy place, you're not as likely to, you know, get 95 years old. And if you're in a super healthy place, you're more likely to, to get old. Okay, I have one... Uh, um... One final question, just curious about uh, the impact of, uh, of these natural um, events, natural disasters on, on your work. I mean, we've had the wildfires in California, the cold wave in Texas. Uh, sometimes we have hurricanes and uh, now COVID. Uh, does that change the direction of your research or are you, 
are is your research pretty much insulated because it has a long term goal? Um, no, it's it's very much um, it, it it addresses it. Uh, or it changes it. Like, for example, with uh, I showed you the COVID research, we, we had never done any like aerosol transport research in this facility. But with COVID, we said, well, we have this, what looks like a conference room where people might, or a classroom that people might want to sit in. But we also look at ventilation, for example, because, you know, with COVID, it's very important that you have good rates of ventilation. You have sensors that can tell you how clean the air is in a building. So we do do pivots where we say, Ventilation is really important now. Uh, how can we produce guidance so people know what offices, like what should your dentist office do? So that, because th they're like, we want to do the right thing, but they're not experts in ventilation and, and, and air changes. So there's a lot of guidance that's, that's produced. Um, for our day-to-day -day work, it affects it a lot. I, I go in one day a week, we have about 10 to 20% of our staff that can go on site for, for doing physical experiments. Everyone else is working from home. So what we're also looking at is how does the energy consumption change of an office building? You know, Take a Bank of America office in San Francisco. Let's say 10% of the people work there, 90% are working from home. Well, you might see that the building actually still uses 80% of its energy um, because the lights are still, if one person's sitting at their desk, there's this area where 20 people are sitting that all the lights are on. You still have to do the air conditioning. You still have to run the elevators. So we're actually seeing like, can you make buildings more efficient with lower occupancy, which never used to be an issue because you build a building for 500 people, maybe it goes 450, maybe a 550 people in it. Now you have 50 people in the building. Yep, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, also for, for, uh, for your work that uh, helps everybody.